welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out. This is a great turnout. For those of you who were here last year, we had just a couple of people. So this is awesome. And we have a bunch of people online tonight, uh, too, probably about 30 people. So that's great. I just want to thank everyone for coming and to call out. We have uh, emergency managers from both sides of the river, online in particular, but also here in IEMA Region 6. Online is IEMA Region 11. Um, and IDNR and Fish and Wildlife Service. So we have a whole bunch of people uh, attending tonight, which is great. And I do want to call out to uh, the folks who are from the Corps of Engineers here. I'm Kathy Van Arsdale with the Emergency Management in the St. Louis District. Um, John Osterhage, who is the chief that you're usually seeing here, Four guys in Hawaii for 60 days helping with the wildfire uh, recovery in Lahaina. So uh, instead we have Pedro Rosario. Uh, he's monitoring our chat and uh, WebEx, but he is the acting chief of EM until John gets back. We also have Brenton Barkley, area engineer for East Side. Keegan McFarland, the area engineer for St. Louis City. Uh, he's our new area engineer there. We have Jeremy Eck, uh, Dam and Levy Safety Chief. Sean Sullivan, Strategic Initiatives Coordinator. Is that good enough? Uh, Jeff Wells, uh, who you saw when he came in as an EM. He's our 408 ICW Program Manager. Lexi uh, Twelman is she's responsible for that awesome sponsored newsletter that we have out there. Uh, that's that's her doing. We also have Katie Ellis, uh, Levy Safety Program Manager, and Joan Stemler, Chief of Water Control. Is there any core people I have missed? Okay, good. Uh, here's our agenda today. Um, there's a few new things that we're going to be talking about, including, of course, changes to programs. Uh, but Joan is also going to talk about low water, which we don't normally have on the agenda, but it was a big topic this year. So uh, we're going to talk about it. Um, there we go. All of our presentations, uh, the recording of our WebEx, as well as the handouts you have out there, and anything that you request that we add uh, will be going on our website after our last meeting on March 11th. So uh, you can you can Google St. You say St. Louis District EM and it will bring you to our handouts and, and recordings for this. Uh, that includes the weather service presentations at all of our locations. So uh, probably the most recent would be in, uh, would be most uh, effective for you, but uh, we do have one for the Illinois River if you're interested. And Cape Girardeau as well. <coughs> I just went through all this, so I'm not going to go through that again, but um, those are our numbers for emergency operations and water control. Those are in the handouts out there as well. So, uh, first and foremost, we're going to do the National Weather Service spring forecast. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so my name is Marshall Thaler. I'm uh, with the National Weather yeah. Service office in St. Louis. Um, <laughs> uh, normally this is being presented by uh, our hydrologist uh, at, at St. Louis, but he's currently out of the country. Um, but I've been working with Mark on a few flood related things over the last over the last year. Um, so I've kind of been learning a lot from him and about kind of what goes into a lot of uh, the spring flood, uh, flood outlook. So with that, we'll go ahead and get into it. <coughs> Bottom line up front, it's looking like a pretty quiet year in terms of flooding. At least at face value. Uh, so breaking it down by the, the main rivers across the area, Mississippi River, we're looking at near average to below average flood risk, um, with flooding unlikely at most locations. Uh, Moving on to the Missouri River, uh, minor flooding is likely at uh, just a few points, uh, including uh, Chamoy and Herman, Missouri, uh, but unlikely elsewhere along the river. And then for the Illinois River, uh, minor flooding is likely by April. Um, minor flooding is pretty typical for the Illinois River, uh, and so that is what we would consider a normal risk uh, since 
most often times we do see at least a little bit of minor flooding uh, during the spring. And then for the rest of the smaller rivers and tributaries, uh, near average to below average flood risk uh, with, most, with flooding unlikely at most locations. So uh, before we really go into the spring uh, flood outlook, we'll kind of look at a few of the ingredients that go into the spring uh, flood, flood forecast. And so those are, those are uh, the precipitation that, that falls in the Navy River Basin, uh, the snowpack uh, for the, that are contained within the major river basins that would be melted and then run off into the, the streams, and then soil moisture of the basin, and then current flow, what are, are we starting out at uh, across the area rivers. So this is the, the last 90 days of precipitation that we've seen across the region. Um, uh, you can see probably not too easy to read since we're in five inch increments here, but most of the region seen about uh, five to, to 10 inches of rain, but that really doesn't mean a whole lot unless we compare that to, uh, to normal. Um, so across the area, we've seen uh, basically below normal precipitation, mainly to the west of the Mississippi River. Uh, we've seen anywhere from uh, 90 to 70 percent of normal, uh, but as soon as you cross the river into Illinois, things are a little bit different. Uh, so over the 90 days, they've seen uh, closer to average or even above average rainfall with some areas even seeing about uh, 130 um, percent. And if you look at the north, uh, there are some areas that have seen above uh, and other areas that are below. So this is the, the latest and greatest for the, the drought monitor um, for the, uh, pretty much the Midwest and uh, Mississippi River Valley. Uh, we've seen dry conditions over the last couple of weeks. It doesn't take um, a very observant person to notice. We haven't seen a whole lot of rain. Uh, so we have seen some deterioration of, of uh, drought across the area, including this, this category here. We call it D1 moderate drought. Um, the footprint of that area has increased some across the area uh, with, with other locations seeing abnormally dry conditions. Um, but it's entirely possible if we don't see substantial rain that those areas would, would uh, continue to expand. Uh, so part of that kind of comes down to how dry are the soils. So this is our calculated soil moisture, um, sort of the ranking of that. So where does that compare to uh, all, all the different times we've seen uh, soil moisture? So these, these uh, orange or browner colors are getting close to the 20th, 10th percentile, so that's where you would consider uh, slightly below average, and then as you get some of these darker colors, more getting to well below average. So nothing too record-breaking or nothing too significant, it's just been, it has been dry. And so uh, this map here, uh, we have Missouri, Illinois, uh, these different points are points along the, the streams and rivers. Uh, where the stream flow is compared to uh, where we typically see it. So these, uh, so these warmer or uh, browner and redder colors are what we consider below normal and much below normal stream flows. So that is, uh, you know, how much water is actually flowing through these rivers. Um, so as I was just saying, we haven't seen a lot of rain, so there's not a whole lot of, of water that's, that's flowing through these rivers. Um, you really have a pretty hard time in the, the St. Louis area uh, of, of finding uh, anywhere that's near normal or even above normal. You have to get further off to the northeast and east into Illinois and then uh, some scattered spots over into uh, western Missouri, northwestern Missouri. And so this is basically the same data, but this is for a specific point. Um, so this is the Missouri River at Herman. This is a pretty long uh, period of time we're looking at. So this is all the way from January 2023 uh, through now. The last, about the last year, uh, and this, this black line is the observed uh, flow level. Um, this green area here in the shading is where we would consider uh, normal flow. Uh, there's kind of a gap of data missing here, but if we kind of fill in that gap, the, the river is going down, um, it's going into below normal uh, stream flow territory. And that's really the, the common trend for a lot of the rivers across the area since we haven't seen uh, much rain is that the stream flows are decreasing, um, which is some differences on, on the starting point. So here at the uh, Valley City on the Illinois River, uh, we did have some flooding, um, flooding last month, uh, mainly from, from uh, some snow melt um, and ice jams. 
but you can see here that we are decreasing pretty quickly. Uh, right now in the middle of, of normal, but it's down quite a bit from where it was. And this is the uh, Mississippi River at St. Louis. Same thing, uh, except for we're starting to cross into the below normal uh, stream flow. So one of the really important things and something that proved very important for the flood outlook last year is what is our, our snow cover across the, uh, across the northern U.S. and central U.S.? Well, there really isn't any this year. <laughs> uh, you really have to, to, uh, to go up to higher elevations since the Rocky Mountains to really see multiple inches of, of liquid equivalent locked into the snow. So what this map is showing is how much liquid equivalent, so if we melted that snow, how much actual liquid would we get. And so there are a few areas here, a couple of swaths of uh, trace to one inch of liquid equivalent. That's not much. Typically, we would see uh, pretty large swaths of multiple inches of liquid equivalent uh, locked up in snow cover up here. Uh, but that is just not the case this year. So this is the, the forecast precipitation from the Weather Prediction Center over the next seven days. Um, don't take the, the values too closely at, at, uh, at their face. Uh, but there is some signal for us to be in a wetter pattern starting next week. Um, as you can see here, these higher rainfall amounts, multiple inches of rain, are really off to our south and off to our east. Um, but there is some potential opportunities for rain over the next, over the next week. Um, looking further beyond that, so I'll be looking through some of the uh, Climate Prediction Center outlooks. Um, so for the six to 10 day time frame, so this is March 5th through the 9th, uh, we're looking at uh, above normal temperatures favored across uh, pretty much the eastern two thirds of the US uh, with above normal precipitation favored. And that's kind of a continuation of some signal, of, uh, maybe a wetter pattern setting up across the region. And pretty much the same thing shows up as we look even further beyond it's the eight to 14 day time frame since so March 7th through 13th or early to mid-March. Um, and then even further beyond that, this is outlook looking at the entire month of March. A um, little bit more of a, of a washout of uh, kind of the temperature signals um, with equal chances of uh, below or above average temperatures. That might kind of seem like a cop-out, uh, but really oftentimes uh, that doesn't mean, basically just means there is no strong signal in, in what we look at um, for long, a long lead time forecast for above or normal uh, or below normal precipitation. That could even mean that we end up uh, closer to normal through that time frame. Uh, and then similar thing into the, the, the precipitation outlook as well. And so looking out even further and over a longer time frame, so this is the outlook for the entirety of spring, so March through, uh, through May. Um, a little bit higher favored uh, chances of above normal precipitation or above normal temperatures as well as precipitation. Um, so definitely could look worse for the rest of the spring um, with maybe maybe some, some hope for uh, uh, precip across the area. So next we'll, we'll step into the actual uh, spring flood outlook. So this is a map of all the different forecast points on the rivers and uh, streams in the area. And the shading is uh, where, so the green is, there's less than a 50% chance of flooding. Um, and then the, the uh, gold color is a greater than 50% chance of minor flooding. Um, and then moderate flooding, 50% chance, greater than 50% chance, um, which you really have to go outside of most of the area and further up into the Illinois River uh, to get those. But we'll dive a little bit deeper here um, into a few of these forecast points. So before I go forward, I'll, I'll kind of explain what, what's being shown here in this, in this graph. Uh, we have these two lines here, the, uh, what we call the historical simulation, which is essentially we're running two versions of, of, uh, of a, the hydrologic forecast model, or essentially the forecast model for the rivers. Um, and this historical simulation is where we run it through all the, the years in the past. And so what we get is kind of what what the normal uh, probability of, of <coughs> given uh, river flood stages are and where we would fall normally with chances of exceeding these different uh, flood stages. And the black line is then we're taking the 
current conditions this year, plugging that into the model, and then that allows us to compare uh, where we would be versus, or to compare where we will be um, to normal. So when you see this black line below the blue line, that means that our uh, chances of flooding are below normal. So right here, uh, the chance of exceeding minor flood stage is the one here, right down to the bottom, 35%, which is around 40% below normal. And uh, it makes sense that even minor flood stage is even lower. Um, that is a little bit closer to the historical average uh, as you get into the higher, uh, higher stages. So this expands a little bit more on specifically the conditional simulation that we run, um, and this kind of shows the distribution of the actual uh, flood probabilities. Uh, kind of the main takeaways of these is if we would actually see any flooding, it likely would not be until uh, later in April or even in early May, and even then, um, the top of this, this green bar is 25% uh, chance um, does not even reach minor flood stage. So what that tells you is, is uh, flooding is unlikely here. Uh, this is the Missouri River at Washington. Um, sorry, I forgot to say for the, for the, the previous one uh, where this was located. Here is the Mississippi River at Winfield. Um, so really the same thing. We're, we're seeing this black line below the, the blue line. So that means we're seeing uh, below average stream flows and stages and with that below average uh, risk of uh, flooding. So for, the, for minor flooding here, we're seeing 40% chance um, in, in, our, uh, in the simulation, and that's about 25% below the historical average. For moderate flooding, 10% um, and 30% below uh, the historical average. Um, kind of the same thing here. Uh, we, see, we saw the Missouri River that if flooding is going to occur, uh, it would probably not be until uh, April or May, and even then, uh, probably is a little bit higher here. The 25% gets a little bit close to the minor flood stage, uh, but still looks pretty unlikely. Here is the Mississippi River at St. Louis. Um, again, uh, it's pretty much the same message. I'm not going to repeat myself too many times here, uh, but really uh, below average chances of, uh, of, uh, of exceeding flood stage. Um, and then even lower probabilities here uh, as we break down the conditional simulation. Uh, as you look here, the Quiver River at Troy, uh, one of the Mississippi River's uh, tributaries. Um, here we see a little bit different. Um, this is also a smaller, uh, a smaller uh, river um, where we actually have uh, historical simulation pretty close to conditional, so about average uh, flood risk across those areas, and some of that might be even because um, these <coughs> are a little bit more kind of reactive to, to uh, rainfall across the area versus the Mississippi River. We need a lot more rain over a long period of time, and there are a lot more, a uh, lot slower response time. Um, so, again, kind of the same thing where if we saw flooding, um, it would be not until early, early, uh, early May, and even then the probabilities are still pretty low. So here is another thing that we have available on our on our uh, on our on our website. Um, this is what we call the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast Service. Um, this is a year-round thing. Um, it's available for I think almost all of the forecast points along the rivers now. Um, but what this it, it what this is is it's not the official forecast from the River Forecast Center. Instead, it's basically a bunch of uh, weather forecast models and uh, hydrologic forecast models blended together, and we're able to sort of get a uh, kind of multiple scenarios or multiple outcomes, and that's what the shading here is showing. Um, it's a little bit harder to see here because the graph is kind of scaled to minor and action level, uh, but this, this blue area here is, after running all those uh, models together, um, where most of them fall, so that'd be most likely uh, level of the of the river, and then going outward from there, um, the more likely we the green 10 to 25 percent chance of occurring, um, and then less likely to be even further out from there. Uh, but again, this is uh, sometimes the RFC forecast can be a little bit different. 
but it's also something good to look at as, some, as it can give you a better idea of more of the ranges of uh, possible scenarios um, than just a deterministic forecast. Um, so I will uh, kind of add an asterisk to all that. Um, so there's a below normal flood risk for pretty much the entire region, um, but if we still were able to get a heavier rainfall and then heavier precip events, multiple events, um, of course, that they play a lot of, out a lot differently, uh, but that's just based on the, the latest information that we have available. So uh, new in 2024, uh, I'll grab the handout. There's handouts out front. Uh, but we will be uh, we'll be retiring our legacy uh, advanced hydrologic prediction uh, service site. We call it AHAPS um, for a new and improved site. Um, this AHAPS site has been on uh, it's been up for a really long time. It was really due for a replacement and an upgrade. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about this uh, new NWCS, which is the National Weather, uh, sorry, National Water Prediction Service, uh, that goes uh, expected to go live later in March. Uh, so if you're interested in looking into that, uh, there are handouts on the table out there, uh, which does provide a lot more easy user interface and also provides a little bit more information to people. Um, and also in September. Uh, the National Water Center will be providing uh, flood inundation mapping for 30% of the U.S. as the in initial push uh, for this flood inundation mapping project, and that includes the St. Louis area. So that'll be another thing that can be viewed on this new NWPS uh, website. So if that's interesting to you, um, I recommend picking up on those flyers. It has the uh, preview site, which you can already see live data on, and you can go ahead and familiarize yourselves with it before it goes operational. Um, so that's really all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has, though, so either here or... or Ever. 
historical art records go back to the 1800s. The first time ever our yearly low was not in either December or January. Usually our lows are flat the Missouri River reduction occurs or we have freeze up in, in cold temperatures. So this is very unusual and actually is kind of quite scary. So if you notice too, um, in 2013, 12 and 13 was an extremely, um, those, those two years were uh, very bad drought. So I threw in the top 10 just to show you. So 13 um, was, you know, an extreme low year. We broke, we were breaking daily lows in January coming into the year. And by July, now this is period of record. This goes back to the 1800s. And we ended up like eighth on the high. So it, it just, it could move like this. And this was from precipitation. And the same thing, we hit 40 point, 40 and a half in uh, 13. So even though we are preparing, you know, for another drought, early drought, because of conditions of snowpack, um, these are the kind of events that can occur. During 2012, we were um, removing pinnacles in the river, and in 2013, like I said, we came in extremely low, and then um, the rain hit. So, um, like in a large river system like this, we have a lot of tributaries, a lot of things that can shift rather quickly. So even though we are preparing for it, we're always watching. And uh, we work hand in hand with Kathy's, Kathy's office. So the minute something uh, starts to change, and we take note of it, and we get a hold of them, and then we go from there. So that's all I have. Um, I think I heard Marshall say no flood this year, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should be in pretty good shape. But seriously, we do we do need some rain. I don't think average rain is going to get us where we need to be right now because of the soil conditions. Um, but he was showing above average precipitation. So if that were to occur, you know, we will be in a lot better shape. So. And we will see um, the beginning of April, we'll see some increased flow because they'll start increasing their flow through navigation. Their flow support starts April 1st. So we will see about close to a two foot rise in St. Louis River State. So that would definitely help us as well. But we're looking forward to seeing that. Uh, seeing that extra flow right now. And if you have any questions, I'll be around after the meeting. Are there any questions online? All right, I'm going to just down on the spot here and see if there's anything that IEMA Region 6 wants to mention. Well, we're, we're Region 8. Oh, Region 8, region sorry. Five, region 8. Uh, so basically, I get a dozen out of the way for Region 8. We cover, our region covers 11 counties. One of them being Madison, which we're at, uh, all Madison County, uh, like a district or not. But uh, just as we talk about it every year, uh, and I, I know it's probably going to happen this year, but just as we talk about it every year, uh, we do have resources available. Now, obviously, there is a process to do that. Um, you first have to exhaust your resources that you have in house and exhaust the resources locally, then go up the chain. So, county. Uh, whatever respective county you are from, uh, and request those resources. Uh, and if the county doesn't have them or exhaust the resources, then it comes to us. So our resources include a lot of stuff. Obviously, you know, a lot of supplies of sandbags. We have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of sandbagging machines that are available to us. Uh, as far as equipment and everything that I got has, trucks, backloads, end loaders, signage, um, barricades, um, and whatever else you may need for, uh, for securing a site or, or blocking roads or uh, anything that could be flooded. Um, on the state police side, uh, if we need uh, just a law enforcement to secure a scene um, for any reason, we have uh, access to that. Um, we could call up the National Guard for additional uh, help uh, for sandbagging and patrolling of the levees. Same thing with corrections. Uh, we could request sex from sexual. Correctional offenders uh, to help you sandbag um, and help monitor the levy. So we have a lot of resources available to us. 
Um, again, we just always ask that locally you exhaust your, your resources that you have um, before you start going up the chain to the county and then to us. Obviously, our resources are free um, and then dependent on uh, 19, 2019 was a bad year. We, were, uh, we overextended a lot of our resources, um, which happened, especially when we have flooding like that from southern part of the state to the northern part of the state. Um, but we, we did do a pretty good job of keeping up with the request. Um, there was some strain and some taxing of some of the resources we have, but um, I think we're prepared for anything that may come our way uh, if it happens again. Thank you, Doug. Um, I know we have Region 11, Brandon Hendricks on. Uh, if there's anything you want to say, not to put you on the spot, but it's fine if you don't. Come on, Brandon, say something. No, I don't have anything further to add. Doug did a great job. I'll pay, I'll pay that money later. <laughs> <laughs> and do we have any uh, regions from uh, Missouri, FEMA on, uh, online? Or any county EMAs want to uh, say anything that we have online or in the room? We have a bunch. Great. Okay, then we'll move on in our agenda. And uh, now you get me talking at you for a little while. Again, I'm Kathy Van Arsdale. I'm the FCC program manager in our emergency management office. That means I uh, work mostly with the non federal levy district. Uh, Jeff Wells, who's in the back, who we'll talk later, he works mostly with the federal levy district. So you guys have heard most of these, most of this stuff before if you've been to these meetings. So I'm going to hit the high points as much as possible. Uh, here's our wheel of doom. Everybody's familiar with that here. Um, the, uh, the main point being that um, if you are eligible in our PL 8499 program, if you are active in that program, you're maintaining your levy up to, up, up to the standards, we've inspected you and you're in the program then if you get damaged during the flood, we can come and help you repair. Of course, there's caveats to that, but in general, you're active in the program, you're eligible for uh, repairs through you know, Public Law 8499. We talk about, you may have heard us talk about our 18 items as far as eligibility. Levy Safety comes out and inspects your levy, and they have a long list of items that they look at. And uh, for emergency management purposes, for CL 8499, we look at a subset of those. And these, we have determined, are the biggest risk drivers on living. So this is what we focus on for eligibility. So maintaining your, your standards, yep. maintaining the standards up to the point is what we look at. And of course, we, we work with you if, if there are some deficiencies and uh, try and keep you active in the program as much as possible. Our response uh, is predicated on the rivers being at or above flood stage, not in every case. Uh, the 2022 flash flood event that happened in St. Louis and St. Charles counties, uh, we were getting calls from levy districts, not for river flooding, the rivers were fine, it was, it was the creeks uh, that were flooding and damaging levees, and so we activated for that. But we normally only activate our EOC for, uh, for flood, riverine flood events. Uh, that, was, that was an exception, and we do make exceptions if, if, there, if, the, uh, if the conditions uh, warrant it. Our commander has to make a declaration of emergency. Again, that happens within minutes. We recommend it. Water control and EM get together and, and tell our colonel, uh, who uh, was, wanted to be here tonight, but he couldn't, um, that we need to activate and he will make that declaration pretty quick. We are out there, and I'll make this point again maybe, we are out there to flood fight with you, not for you. So. The local resources, both the levy districts and the county and the municipality emergency managers have to be out there flood fighting as well. Um, so we're there to support you. And so uh, there, are, uh, there are places where, where the levy districts or the municipalities don't flood fight. 
uh, we can give advice, but we're probably not going to be out there sandbagging your levy for you if you're not out there as well. And uh, like Doug said, the state has to request that we engage as well. With web EOC and email and you know all of those communication resources, that happens instantaneously. So it's not like we have to have something go through snail mail for us to activate. Our uh, assistance consists of technical assistance as well as direct assistance, and I'll just tell you. Our technical assistance is why our flood fight team uh, who are represented here by Brent Barkley and Kia McFarland is the area engineer. That's why we're out there. We're out there to give you our technical expertise, how to address an issue that's happening during flood. You can take that advice or leave it. If we are not telling you what to do. We are suggesting, based on our expertise, what to do uh, in the event of flood to address specific issues. Um, we don't pay for your flood response. We pay for our flood response. Our teams are our, our cost, not your cost. There are no cost to you for our teams to be out there as good as you. Um, but uh, so, but um, we're not the first line of flood fight. You guys out there are the first line, and we're there to support you. We don't direct evacuation. We may provide information that would inform somebody to make uh, an evacuation order, but that's, we don't we don't direct any anybody to go evacuate. Um, an important note, for communication purposes during a flood, we have liaison officers uh, from the Corps of Engineers sitting in the state EOCs in Springfield. We have Sean Sullivan is, the, is our liaison officer in Springfield. And Hal Graves, if you know Hal, is generally our liaison officer in Jefferson City. They are there to facilitate communication from the field and from the state down and to coordinate efforts at the state level. So efforts are not duplicated, information is conveyed in a timely, very timely manner. So we have somebody sitting there with the other state agencies so everything is coordinated and, it ha and the information exchange happens both up and down the chain very quickly. Our direct assistance, so our, our technical assistance is our flood fight teams, the EOC being activated, our liaison officers, uh, providing information and support to your flood site. But we also have the direct assistance, which everybody should be familiar with, that we do issue uh, equipment and, uh, and materials um, that we have available. And I will get into that more specifically, exactly what we have. We have empty sand bags, and we do not have sand. So, uh, so we do not supply the sand. Um, they come in these crates, and we do have somebody uh, on call. They're not at our warehouse all the time, so if you need something, please call EOC. And this is after you've exhausted the chain that Doug, Doug talked about through the local, regional, and state. If they can't provide it for you or in a timely manner <coughs> for whatever reason, uh, you would come to us and call our EOC, and we'll have somebody meet you out at our warehouse to run our forklift, and you have to bring a trailer, a truck, to load these crates onto your, onto your, uh, onto the vehicle. Uh, we also have poly sheeting that we can provide as well. We also have available, although not at our warehouse, we have other flood fight materials that are available from our flood fight materials center in Rock Island District. It takes about 24 hours uh, to get those down, but so if you need it, let us know and we'll arrange to have those delivered to our warehouse. Um, you have to come and get them. We, we do not deliver materials or equipment. You'll have to come get them. We have the, uh, the, the large sandbags that are airless capable as well as the HESCO barriers or are gave me a basket. So they're better known as HESCO available from Rock Island. Our, our automatic sandbag filling machine, we have one here. Uh, Rock Island has more, but um, it comes with a crew of two, and at no cost to you. Again, they're like a flood fight team, it's our cost, but they're there to maintain the machine. They're not there to fill sandbags, they'll train people how to do it, how to use the machine, but they're there to maintain the machine um, and uh, bring it wherever it's needed. So uh, that, um, that they are out of our um, service space down on the river, they're also dredge and, and Stuff like that. So they're there to maintain the machine, not fill the sandbags necessarily. 
Our, automa our knuckle breaker, our, automa our manual sandbag machine is available too. It's on the trailer. Um, and uh, it's first come, first serve. But again, request it up through the state. The state will let us know if, if uh, our machines need to be deployed. We also have uh, about 16 crystal fully phones, 8 and 12 inch at our warehouse. These are PTO driven, so you need to uh, provide the power for those. Their tires are not road ready, so you'll need to have a trailer. Again, our forklift operator can load them onto your trailer, but they're not highway rated tires. Uh, we also can get diesel pumps from Rock Island District. I believe Alden, the city of Alden, during 2019 flood and Clarksville uh, got some, some diesel powered pumps. Uh, that we delivered within 24, we delivered to our warehouse within 24 hours. Um, so we have those available from our island. Again, first come, first serve. 2019 was very interesting because I believe the state ran out of most things and Rock Island ran out of most things. It was the, the whole Mississippi, so they were going everywhere. So uh, once we're out, we're out. So, uh, but that was an unusual situation. We're potentially adding other things like these water filled barriers uh, from Rock Island, not at our location, but we can potentially get them in the near future from Rock Island. It's being determined now. We, uh, the state has provided these in the past down in Southern Illinois uh, that our flood fight teams assisted uh, with the point. So uh, they do not need sand, they're water filled. There are some drawbacks to them, but uh, I'm sure that the manufacturers can determine that. Uh, they tend to roll some of them when they're filled with water, so there's something you have to do to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, this is the location of our warehouse um, where you need to pick up stuff. It's in Granite City, Illinois. And to return, we ask that you return any equipment that you borrowed within 60 days of the end of the flood in the condition that you borrowed it. It's on the hand receipt that you'll sign when you take it out that says, yes, I will return it within 60 days of the, from the end of the flood. There are limitless options for uh, private purchase out there, uh, but just make sure that if you're purchasing things that uh, look for the ANSI or the FM250 uh, stamp because that means that they've been rigorously tested and, and approved for the purpose that they're out there. There's probably a lot of stuff that aren't, that isn't tested that might be out there. So just be aware that um, those things give it a stamp of approval, not from the core, but from whoever's testing it. Um, our flood response is anything that we, we suggest you do or insist you do is a temporary thing. Um, as you know, FEMA. <laughs> declaration made, being able to withhold payment, reimbursement of your flood site uh, expenses until you take down your sandbags or whatever else you put on your levy during a flood. Uh, they generally will wait for that to happen before they reimburse. <coughs> uh, the removal of all those, all those materials are your responsibility. Uh, we do not assist with that. And please, if you're going to make an intentional uh, breach of your levy, please give us a call first. Um, because if you if you are, uh, want us to help you repair it after the flood, we need to know ahead of time and and talk to you about that before before you do that. And it also affects the downstream forecast on the water control. Uh, if there's a breach, then the downstream forecast will change based on that breach. And so uh, sometimes we learn about a breach from water control. They see the gauges below it drop, and they'll say, hey, we think there's a breach somewhere upstream of St. Louis. There's something, you know, because they'll see a drop. So it would be nice to know that ahead of time before you do that. We're not going to prevent you from doing it, but we need to know that if you want to get it afterwards. <coughs> what do we repair? These are the items that we can repair after a flood. Again, it does not guarantee that we will, but this, these are the items that we can repair, and we do not address these issues. One thing that came up during the 2019 flood was uh, there was it was going around that we would we would 
pay for debris removal along levy, and the, the Corps does not do that. Other federal agencies might, NRCS, FEMA, uh, may have programs that will assist with that, <coughs> but, but the Corps of Engineers does not assist with debris removal. As I said, flood fight material removal or levy cuts if you haven't called us first is it, very difficult for us to, to fix. Even if you're, if you're active in our program and you have damages, and they fit those criteria I just said, it's not guaranteed that, uh, that we'll be able to uh, fix all of them. The big thing is funding might not be immediately available. Um, there was one year where we had Harvey and Irma and Man Maria and a flood, multiple floods across the U.S., and we had to get a wait to finish the repairs on levy districts. We had 34 levy districts damaged at that point. And it took a, a supplemental, a congressional supplemental to get all the funding for that. So it, it, all the funding might not be available immediately. And our, uh, your benefit cost ratio in general has to be above one, meaning it has to be uh, a, good, a good buy for the taxpayer. It has to have benefits above what it costs the taxpayer in general. There are exceptions to that. I won't go into that. That's on a case-by-case -case basis. And our division must approve the project. That's what uh, we, we do a report called a PIR. Many of you are familiar with the project information report. That is a report that we send out to division to, to start the project and get funding. For those of you that are federal levy, our repairs are 100% our cost. We built the levies, um, but except for real estate and borrow material. Those are a levy district responsibility. Non-federal levies, levies that were not built by the Corps of Engineers, it's 80-20 uh, core and uh, levy responsibility. For the 2019 flood, the state of Missouri paid a portion of the non-federal cost share. I don't know if that will be happening in the future. Um, there was a big focus on the Missouri River levees uh, at that point from, from the governor of Missouri and other governors of the Missouri. So uh, it may or may not happen in the future. It would be great if it did, but um, that happened in 2019, which assisted with the cost share. And your cost share can be working kind as well, not just cash. You can be cash, working kind, or a combination. You heard us say that, and you know if you've experienced it, that our repair process is not fast. Um, it's because of various laws that we have to make sure we meet. One thing that you can do to speed up the process from your side is start talking to your landowners and considering where you're going to get borrow material. That often is an impediment to moving forward as well. It's not just on our side. So borrow material is very important. And very often the real estate for that borrow is very uh, difficult to get. So start thinking about where you might get suitable borrow material for repairs and talking to those landowners if they're not, if it's not owned by the, by the levy district. And, make, and get those in, a, in, in place or try to get them as far in place as possible. Right. Just hit that. Uh, Shane Simmons, who many of you know, is the project manager for PLA 499 repairs. If you had any damages in the last uh, couple of floods, uh, he was the one who was who was uh, talking to you about those. So, uh, and you can, and if you have any questions for him, feel free to call any of us too. We can put you in touch with him if you don't have his number already. Okay. That being said. They are proposing changes to the PO8499 program. We talked about them last year if you were here. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details. I think they're positive changes, um, but uh, currently we focus on the inspections. Are you acceptable, unacceptable, or minimally acceptable? And it's almost cut and dry. Of course, there's flexibilities that we, liberties that we take with that to work with you. But it's going more toward uh, assessing your, your main risks and addressing those, as opposed to cut and dry, check yes, yes or no. Here are the things that, again, these are proposed. We don't have a final yet. We expected the final changes to be 
to have been happening already. Maybe by the end of next year, maybe by the fall, we'll have the actual changes. So these are proposed. We don't know what the end game is going to look like uh, for sure. But these are the criteria that we'll be potentially looking at. Operation maintenance and inspection plan. For the levy district, and, and if you're a federal levy district, you have, should have an O&M manual, but updating those and looking at your risks and your long-term plans to address those risks, and Jeremy will hit that too. What are you doing to, if you know you're going to have to replace a bunch of pipes, what do you do, what's your long-term plan to address? each of those uh, over over the years. How are you how are you going to do that? What's your plan? Getting that down on paper, updating your current O and M manual or creating it if you don't already have it. <coughs> we will help with every single one of these and have templates if, if if you don't already have one. Emergency preparedness action plan, EAP. It's a big word for what do you do when you flood? What, what are the things that you do? Where are your supplies? Who has the keys? Who do you call? Uh, who, who's at the municipality are you calling? What's their number uh, when there's an issue going on with your levy and, and, the, and they need to declare an you know, evacuation or something like that? Getting all that down on paper is what the EAP is. And what triggers? What, what stage of the river are, or do you overtop at a certain location? Just so you get it on paper and somebody can pick it up off the shelf and pretty much know what's going on during the flood. Again, we will have templates and work directly with you to establish your EAP. But that is one of the new criteria that we are going to be looking at for, uh, for the uh, eligibility of your levy. Participation or sharing information. It's not letting everybody behind your levy know that, that you have a potential risk. It's the stakeholders, your sheriff's office, your, your municipalities, your street department, those, those types of stakeholders need to know what's going on with your levy. What have you improved? What do you need to work on just so they're aware of any potential issues that might come up? And please come out on our, and Jeremy will this too, please, or Katie, Please come out on, on the levy inspection. You know your levy district best. Um, if there are things that, uh, that you know or you know that you are planning and uh, that can be addressed in our inspections, which we will still do, um, please come out with us so we, you can talk to us and it's not just us looking at something from, from, uh, from a vacuum. So uh, please participate in those things. And all of this is scalable. Uh, St. Louis flood system documents aren't going to look the same as COOS levy system documents. So it's scalable as for the size and complexity of the levy district. All of these items are. And good news is, what we're hoping will come out in the final is that we will be more flexible with the repairs. That perhaps we can add in some things that are in addition to repairing to pre-flood conditions. So any place that might have repeated damages, maybe we can do extra things uh, too, such as the things listed here, setbacks or armoring of the levy, so we don't have to keep paying for the same damages every year. So hopefully we'll have some flexibility and be able to make some improvements as opposed to just putting it back the way it was when it, when it was damaged. That was a lot of information. Are there any questions about what I talked about? And I'm, I'll be here afterwards too. Okay. We are now going to hear from Katie Ellis. Our Levy Safety Program Manager. Hi all, I'm Katie Ellis and I'm going to give you guys a levy safety update. We're going to talk about 
our levy safety team in St. Louis, uh, the levy safety program update. We have a new national levy database. Our FY24 activities, including inspections and risk assessments, and then FY25 and 26 look ahead, as well as risk communication. Um, Long-time LSPM Rachel Lopez has moved on. We've had several interim LSPMs. I'm currently filling in. In August, um, Chelsea Hilsman will be filling in. And many of you know Jeremy Eck, who's filled several roles over the years. If you can't figure out who to call, you can always call Jer Jeremy and he'll put you in the right direction. As far as program and policy updates, this, I think this is similar to year <coughs> with the inspections. We are no longer doing segment and system ratings. Um, instead of routine inspections on the non feds we'll be doing special inspections, and we're going to do those on a two to three year cycle. Um, and then at the end of the inspection, we'll have a levy risk management summary, and that'll provide prioritized recommended actions. And we'll get together in an out brief and talk those through with you guys. There is a new national levy database out there. It looks totally different. If you haven't checked it out, um, take a look. It's got lots of neat graphs and information of the outcomes that they were going for was just trying to make the information more usable for you all and improve data sharing. For our formal inspections on the federal levy this year, we just had four. Three of the field inspections are complete and we have Monarch Chesterfield scheduled for April. On the non-federals, we're just getting started with those this week and we have 10 scheduled, including Riverport. For the screening level risk assessments, we've got a bunch in the hopper. Um, I don't think any of these folks are here. So we have some from FY23 that we're still working on, and then we've got several more this FY as well. This is probably teeny tiny, but for the FY25 and 26 outlook for the federal systems, we've got a lot planned. We'll have formal inspections um, as well as periodic assessments, which is simply just a formal inspection and that risk assessment that happens together. Oh, some we've got in 25 include St. Louis with a site visit, so not a formal inspection yet. MESC, 26 we've got, Consolidated North County, and Wood River. For the non-federal systems, we have twos in 25, and Earth, Earth City Report again, and 26. Again, those are going to be shifting to a two to three year cycle. For risk communication effort, um, we are going to work with sponsors to develop uh, different communication products and plans if you'd like us to. One thing that we've got going on right now with the Cascadia, Cascadia Island Drainage and Levy District. Um, they had some trouble where people were tearing up the, with the equipment, they were tearing up the berms. Uh, they wanted to raise awareness and we made these, we got together with them and collaborated on these stickers and they're providing the stickers there in the levied area to raise awareness about not tearing up the levy toe. Um, we are available to do things like this with you all. If, if, if anyone's interested or has good ideas or, or wants to just talk, give us a call. We'll also be doing um, PSAs with local radio stations again this flood season. Many of you picked up our Levy Sponsor newsletter that was out on the table that Lexi put together for us. Um, if you have a good idea and, and you want to get involved or get your story in there, give us a call. Lexi's contact information is here or contact any of us and we'll get you in touch with us and share stories or, or success stories from one levy district to another. And then we've got several references available. You can check out that new National Levy Database. Um, there is information and references available on the National Levy Safety Program website, levysafety.org. And then our St. Louis District Levy Safety website is being updated. We're going to try to get some informational brochures and things that might be helpful for you all on there. If you have any other ideas that might you might want to see on there, let us know.
That's all I have, Jeremy. You have anything you need to add? Any questions? Thanks. And next we'll hear from Jeff Wells, our ICW 408 program manager, and then I'll open it up to the room. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Wells. I'm the uh, Inspection and Completed Works Program Manager and Section 4A Coordinator for St. Louis District. Uh, quick agenda: what we'll be covering uh, for the for this evening's topics. Uh, going into Section 4A permission. So basically, if there's a, if you have a federal system and you got somebody that wants to make an alteration in your federal system, uh, you have, basically a Section 4A permission is required to make that alteration. So. Uh, back in the day, it may seem like forever ago, but can, you know, Congress did federally authorize and, and provide funding for these uh, uh, levy systems. So anytime you want to make a change to that authorized system, you have to do, you know, a Section 408 permission to actually, uh, you know, complete that process to make that change. So uh, what, what we do basically is at USACE is, you know, we're looking for these um, um, items that, you know, we're going to make sure that that alteration is not going to, you know, impair the usefulness of the of the federal project. You know, it's not going to be injurious to the public interest and it also meets the legal and policy requirements to uh, uh, to make that change. So uh, during our review process, uh, that's what we're looking for. Uh, we have technical review, um, you know, we have National Environmental Policy Act uh, requirement and then a cultural um, uh, requirement as well to make sure we're compliant with Section 106. Uh, so the bottom line, if you do have somebody that wants to put a pipeline or a you know transmission line across your levy, uh, reach out to me early on in the process. The earlier we get engaged at USACE, the kind of the easier it is uh, to to complete that process and kind of you know steer the steer the process to the to the right direction. And so alterations that basically occur without you know that permission letter without that. Permission from you states they can't affect your eligibility. It can become an encroachment in your levy system if they're not, you know, properly documented and the, the review is not completed uh, correctly. Uh, so going into PL 8499 eligibility, we're still actually working off the 2014 interim policy guidance. Um, so, like Kathy mentioned, a lot of our guidance is changing. A lot of our uh, requirements are changing, as well as the eligibility guidance that you know may change as well. So. Uh, we're still working off the 18 eligibility items that we talk about, uh, Kathy put up on the board, and we kind of go out and verify those uh, items based on the uh, continued eligibility section, or inspections that uh, uh, the levy safety personnel go out and do those inspections through their site visit and formal inspection programs. Uh, so like we said, change is coming. Uh, start thinking about those emergency action plans, start working those up, um, you know, start, you know, putting those pieces together because uh, that's going to be part of what we're looking at as far as eligibility coming in the future, and not just the functionality of the uh, the levy system. Uh, so the O and M manual updates, you know, within that O and M manual, start thinking long term as well for the maintenance of, uh, you know, your relief wells, your culverts. You know, if you got a culvert, brand new culvert, it's a, um, you know, been in the ground for only a couple years. You've done your, you know, initial camera inspection when you placed it. You know, it's a it's a reinforced concrete pipe. It's going to have a design life at least probably 50 years. So you can say, hey, this this design's going to or this culvert's going to function for for the next 50 years. But you know, you still got to work on those inspections and do that uh, cycle that uh, our, our levy safety uh, personnel kind of put together and help you guys work with. Uh, but if you got some of them old corrugated metal pipes that are out there that have been in the ground for you know, 20, 30 years, those are, you know, those are getting close to the end of the life cycle there. So uh, start start thinking about replacement of those and, uh, you know, start, but bottom line is start working those plans and, and working those processes and start thinking about it kind of as holistically as a system because that's what we're going to be, you know, looking into in the future and putting those plans together. Uh, and then partic participation, like we said, we always come in here and say participate in your levy inspections. You know, go out, meet with us during the site visits when we come out. Uh, we can sit down, you know, talk talk stuff in the system, and then, you know, generally we like to have somebody there on the formal inspections when we're, you know, walking the systems that are out there, you know, each day and, and at least, you know, touching base in the morning and, 
and if not, walk in the whole system with the, with the, the levy safety team. Uh, so SWIFT, uh, the system-wide improvement framework, so basically this is what happens if you get in trouble with the, uh, with the core where you've had a few successive unacceptable uh, ratings. Uh, so basically what you're trying to do is bring your system back into compliance with the, with the USAID inspection program. So uh, you may have some complex costly repairs that you want to focus on first, uh, you know, but those, those processes uh, have to be in place. And, and put together to uh, to get you back in you know into good graces and eligible with the PLU 499 program. So we generally start with the letter of intent. It's you know it's a pretty intensive document. You know you start documenting what the deficiencies are that you have. Uh, you put it into a letter. We send it up to our headquarters. Um, it comes back down to us. We do some back and forth, get it approved. Uh, once that SWIFT our letter of intent is is approved. Then you guys get an additional two years of eligibility with the PLA 499 once that's approved. Uh, so basically in that interim, in that two years, you start working on your SWIFT plan. Uh, you develop that plan of like, hey, we're going to complete these items this year, this year, this year. And, you know, at the end, generally of the two-year, you know, part of it, you're back into the, you know, into the, in the good graces with the core and you guys are back eligible for the PLA 49 program. Uh, we can't extend that to a year as long as you guys uh, are making uh, you know substantial progress, and you're making those uh, you're meeting those requirements, and and you know you are putting that good faith effort into it. Uh, we understand that funding is complex, and you can't always get it. Uh, you can't always make the repairs that you want to, just because uh, you know resources aren't available. But generally, we're going to work with you guys to you know put that to, put that sweat together. Bottom line is you know we'll be there helping helping throughout the process, but. Uh, but also, you know, as long as you guys are making that good faith effort, we're, we're there to help you guys out. Uh, so technical support. So anytime, uh, you know, somebody wants to, you know, do something around your system, uh, you can, you know, put them in touch with us. You, you guys can reach out to us. Any questions you guys might have, just don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, you know, for the non-fed systems as well, if you got somebody that wants to, you know, cross the utility across your, your levy system, it's not the same Section 408 process, uh, but we can uh, provide that technical assistance to you guys as well. But, um, you know, we do levy safety reviews, uh, but, you know, St. Louis, Wood River, MESD, very frequently. Uh, we basically do that to kind of help document the process. Uh, so, you know, if there's anything that's close to an encroachment, we take a look at it and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do that review and we also have to document and make sure you know, those, those, you know, modifications, you know, in the vicinity of the levy are, are done, you know, what we would call technically acceptable and, you know, it's not going to be a risk driver if, if something does get constructed near the levy. Um, so we can provide technical support anytime you guys reach out to us. If you want to have, uh, you know, conversation with us about a scour on a creek or something like that, just, just reach out. We can send some materials engineers out. You know, take a look, give you guys a, you know, napkin sketch or something like that to, uh, you know, for you guys to implement. Uh, but we can get those, uh, you know, those, you know, key personnel out to you guys and help help provide that to, uh, assistance. And, you know, we can we can meet on the ground. If you guys want to send pictures to us at the, at the district, if you want something, you know, writing, we generally do a, a trip report after those uh, site visits. We can get that documented and, and uh, you know, bottom line, it helps us, or you know, it helps us document those maintenance activities you guys actually complete during uh, during your efforts. So, and one other thing, it also kind of helps ensure um, you know compliance with the regulatory program. So, you know, when it comes to Section 408, it's really up to the levy districts to enforce encroachments on the levy systems. Uh, but if you're working and, and doing some, you know, creek straightening or something of that sort. Generally, that's a, a regulatory function, and, and you know, Rob Grampy and his uh, folks in the regulatory office, they, they manage that regulatory program within the St. Louis district. But if you do go out, you know, do some creek straightening or something like that, you don't have the, uh, the core permit for that, it can actually get you into hot water with the EPA, and you can, you know, end up getting some fines or something like that. So if, if you do those, have those, you know, items or, or actions that are close to levies, you want to reach out to us, we can... We can take a look at those and then also have our uh, regulatory folks uh, review those as well uh, to, you know, make sure you're in that uh, compliance. 
uh, major points. So bottom line, participate in the inspections. We always say it. We're here. We, you know, we want to you know work with you guys. Uh, you know, to maintain these systems and and uh, you know keep keep your levies functioning the way they were designed and intended to to function. So uh, semi-annual maintenance updates. Uh, we got the maintenance forms in uh, in our our materials out there. Uh, just provide those to levy safety or myself. Uh, you know, on that semi-annual basis. Um, you know, preparing for future flood events. So if you, you know, if we know that the river's coming up, we're going to start reaching out to you guys. With bottom line, up to you guys. You know, to do those kind of initial key things before we can get out. Take a look at driver systems. You know, take a look at your flap gates, your relief wells. Make sure there's not, you know, you don't have a log or something jammed in a flap gate that you know holds that flap gate off. Then you got a continuous backflow of water coming into your levee system just because. You know, there's a couple sticks or something like that in in those flap gates. Um, one thing we've we've seen is kind of a um, you know good idea maybe is is you know maybe a steel pole or something that at your you know the outlet structures where those flap gates are located. So that way, if you do have you know issues during the flood, you know you know you're not just looking you know you can't see it because you know it's 20 feet of water. But if you got a stake that's sticking a couple feet out of that water. You know where that flap gate's at. We've had um, we've had levy districts that you know sank some mattresses and and seeded those mattresses and you know stopped the backflow of, of water going on the, into the system. We've also had you know load up a couple hundred sandbags in a boat and just bomb the bomb the you know the flap gate with the with the boat and kind of plug that water up and and keep that backflow from happening. So that's kind of a you know just kind of one of those things that you guys can implement or. You know, look out for and, and maybe you know work with during during that pre-flood situation. We know the river's coming up, and also keep an eye out for any erosion or slides or animal burrows. It, anything that you can try to you know get fixed or you know repaired prior to the river coming up. Uh, update your contacts. Uh, everybody checked in. We talked about it, but everybody online has something to think about. If you have any changes in personnel in your levy districts. Uh, just reach out to us, let us know, or, or fill out one of the uh, uh, contact sheets that are uh, available out there on the desk. Uh, so we do have our guidance and contact information. Uh, they're on our website. You can Google that as well. You know, type in uh, St. Louis District uh, Emergency Operations, and, and that information will come, come up as well. And you know, really, the bottom line is, don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime you guys have questions and need support. Uh, we'll be there for you. You know, we'll get somebody out if if need be. But bottom line, reach out. You can reach out to myself, Jeremy, Katie, anybody here. You know, if they're not the right person to answer the question, we can put you in touch with that right person uh, uh, to get those answers for you guys. Uh, any questions out of me? My contact information's up here. Uh, contact information's on about three or four different things out there on the on the table, and especially on the back of that levy sponsored newsletter. We'll, you know, push that out to you guys and kind of kind of share those good ideas. But on the back of that, uh, those updated contacts for the the key personnel at the at St. Louis. So, any questions? All right. Thanks for everyone's time. That is all the talking at you that we're going to do tonight. Um, is there anything that the room or online would like to discuss anything that you would like to see us talk about next time. Uh, do know that our last, uh, this is our second to the last uh, flood workshop. Our next one will be in Waterloo, so it's in the area. So if there was somebody who couldn't make it tonight and didn't, weren't able to uh, log into our WebEx, uh, Waterloo is on the 11th of March, uh, 6.30. So uh, feel free to let them know that they can come to that one as well. Uh, we have next week off. Um, there's a bunch of people going to con talk to congressmen in D.C. So uh, we're taking a week off from these. But the 11th of March in Waterloo um, is our next one. But is there anything anybody else, anybody wants to talk about? Anything at all with the people who are in the room or online or suggestions for next year? They're, as you can tell, they're renovating the museum a little bit, so there was a little noise going on, but that's a good thing that they're getting some of that done. Um, all right, well, we'll hang out.
And if you want to talk individually with us or each other, uh, more than welcome. Thank you again for coming out. Um, next year, hopefully John Osterhage won't be in Hawaii kicking up his heels. And Jen Molman in our office left today for Hawaii for 30 days as well. So uh, we have a couple of yams uh, in Hawaii. So maybe my turn will be coming up. But thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.